If we could talk to the animals, learn all their languages, maybe take an animal degree. If I conferred with our furry friends, man to animal, think of the amazing repartee. If I could walk with the animals, talk with the animals, grunt and squeak and squawk with the animals, and they could talk to me. Hello and welcome to Pet Watch, a monthly program about the Williamson County Animal Control and Adoption Center. I'm Debbie Sims and I'll be your host today and my special guest is our staff veterinarian, Dr. Deborah Birch. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Welcome to Pet Watch. Thanks. Um, Deborah came on board with the Animal Control Agency back in the summer. I believe it was mm -hmm. August. August. Mm -hmm. And she came to us from uh, seven years of practice in the Her in the Hermitage area, right? right? Yes. Right. So most of your uh, veterinary career had been in private practice right. up to this mm -hmm. point. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up and where you attended veterinary school. Well, I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I went to undergraduate and veterinary school at North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of became my home for a while. Right. And then spent <clears throat> a year practicing there before I moved to Tennessee mm -hmm. uh, once I was married. I was reading about NC State's veterinary school, and it, it kind of looked more like a working farm. Yes, we th did. Than an academic. We did. I mean, it, it was a huge barn, and mm -hmm. you had a, actually what I was reading was that that was the way that the students could get experience with actual farm life with larger mammals yes. like cows, horses, and that kind of thing. We did. We did it all: sheep, goats, pigs, chickens. So we wow. had it all. Well, do does a veterinary school like NC State also have a, a veterinary clinic like we would be familiar with a, a regular vet's office for domestics like dogs yes. and cats? We did. We did more specialty services. We didn't do a lot of general practice in the veterinary hospital, but we mm -hmm. uh, saw small animals on a referral basis. Yeah. And did you have a particular in area of interest when you were in school? or? I did. I always enjoyed the small animals more than the large animals, so I knew mm -hmm. I wanted to do that. and. Uh, have always enjoyed medicine and surgery in particular. Mm -hmm. Well, you're getting plenty of practice of your surgery skills now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did you have animals when you were growing up, or how did you get in the mindset of becoming a veterinarian? Right. Well, I always had animals growing up, especially cats and dogs, and always loved them. But I actually didn't know that I wanted to go to veterinary school until when I had graduated from undergrad, mm -hmm. and I was working in a veterinary hospital. Kind of started in the kennel not really sure what I was going to do after I'd gotten out of college mm -hmm. and I uh, started was kind of trained as a technician and uh, ultimately decided I wanted to go back to veterinary school and wow. become a vet. Were you one of those kids that brought home a lot of animals? Yes. <laughs> and your mother would go, what now? <laughs> right. <laughs> so what was the weirdest thing you ever brought home and thought? Oh gosh, <laughs> we, we would bring home turtles and frogs and anything we would find in the woods or the yard to uh, right. try and make a little habitat for it. And right. So Turtles are popular because you you can catch them. Right. They're slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of kids bring home turtles, keep them in a shoe box. And, yeah. But that's, you know, you probably planted the seed for yourself. I um, think I did. I yeah. think I probably should have known much earlier that that's what I was meant to do. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, it, it comes when it comes. Yep. You can't <laughs> force it. Um, was there any particular area of research study that, at NC State that you um, participated in or had an interest in? Well, we did a research on diabetes that I participated in on cats and testing a certain kind of insulin to see if it would regulate diabetes in cats uh, better than what was available at the time. So that was really the research that I was involved in at one point. Do cats have diabetes more often than dogs? They do, mm -hmm. and a lot of it is uh, often brought on by obesity in cats. Oh, just the same as with humans? Mm -hmm. Yes. Lifestyle changes? Yes. Dietary changes? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of cats are indoor and they're very mm -hmm. sedentary and they uh, graze and become mm -hmm. overweight and that can certainly be a risk factor for diabetes. Wow. Uh, I was thinking when we were planning the show that all of us who are, are, are watching the show today who have pets, uh, we love our veterinarians. We we feel like we have the only pet in the world yes. and they mean the world to us when we go to the vet. Um, we have a special relationship with someone who understands our, our uh, animal and their needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been in that world as well. Um, 
but now you're in another world yes. where every day you are responsible for a large number right. of dogs and cats, basically, mm -hmm. that we don't even know who the owners are. Yeah. Uh, so it's a flip-flop of the whole philosophy is that suddenly you're running the hospital, basically, mm -hmm. for anywhere from 100 to 150 in-house uh, dogs and cats every day. Right. As a shelter, uh, we do put animals through adoption and they leave, and but a new supply comes in. Um, tell us in your world now at the shelter, uh, what medically happens on your end of the spectrum when mm -hmm. a new dog or cat ends up at our shelter for various reasons, either surrendered, astray, or, or whatever happens. What do you do with medically to assess that animal when it comes mm -hmm. in? Well, I rely a lot on the uh, staff to be my eyes and ears because we do have such a large volume of animals that they kind of are the ones that bring the problems to my attention. Mm -hmm. um, and they leave me a note that this dog has a skin condition or this dog is limping or this cat was surrendered for behavioral reasons and mm -hmm. you know it needs to be checked. So those are the individuals that usually end up getting a, a full examination and determining if you know x-rays might be needed that we will occasionally send an individual out for um, or you know blood work urinalysis things mm -hmm. like that to mm -hmm. see if there's something specifically wrong with an individual coming into the shelter uh, when an animal comes in we automatically administer certain vaccinations right right, right. We do, we give every dog and cat their core vaccines, um, and if they're old enough for a rabies vaccination, they get that on intake as well. And that's really meant to decrease the spread of disease in the shelter population. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also dewormed and treated for uh, fleas, again, to try and keep our shelter sure. population as healthy as possible. Because we really have an unknown, medically we have no history. Right, and that can be challenging at times to know if these conditions are uh, chronic or is this mm -hmm. a, because that definitely can change what mm -hmm. the possibilities are, are of going on in an individual. Right, and with uh, your surgical skills, you were telling me in your diagnostic skills that you recently um, had a cat come in mm -hmm. that was owner surrendered for incontinence mm -hmm. and and tell me about how that how that ensued your your sure. uh, you ended up really serving as that cat's veterinarian right yeah well our, our understanding was the cat was urinating on the floor right in front of the owner outside of the litter box but she assumed it was a behavioral problem and did not take her cat to the vet to mm -hmm. see if there was an underlying medical reason and so often there is in cats that are urinating outside of the litter box and uh, when we did a urinalysis it was very suspicious for bladder stones and so we sent the cat for an x-ray and sure enough it had two large bladder stones in its bladder so I did surgery to remove those stones and the cat did great and uh, was adopted by a new owner who is very happy with her kitty. Oh, good. So, good. Very happy that's, ending. That's a great story. Um, so much of your day is spent in surgery at our facility, <clears throat> excuse me, simply because we are at our goal is to spay and neuter every animal before yeah. it gets into adoption. And I think we're on, a, on the road to catching up to catching up with that. We had a little backlog of it before you came on board. Um, and I know I've heard figures that how many spay and neuter surgeries did you do in a month? recently or we did 240 in August in August and, uh, okay don't have the numbers just yet for September right so. right but still we're uh, raising the bar as far as <coughs> the challenge being to keep up with the in yes. influx of new animals um, talk about this the spay and neuter is obviously important mm -hmm. for overpopulation of pets because I think it's an astronomical number as particularly in cats that two right unaltered cats can produce a huge number of offspring in four or five years. So right. um, what other than overpopulation are the advantages of spaying and neutering for those people who might be watching mm -hmm. who may think, I don't want to do that to my pet. Well, it's really a positive thing. Let's, right. let's talk about what the positive aspects are for people in our audience who may have held back on having that done to their own 
um, pet at home? Well, absolutely. Uh, early spaying and neutering will reduce the incident of, incidence of certain diseases later in life. So things like uh, breast cancer in dogs, if they are spayed before they uh, go through a, a heat cycle, mm -hmm. their chances of breast cancer is dramatically decreased. Um, it also impacts behavior. There's less aggression, less tendency to roam. Um, just many, so many the male, benefits. an unaltered male, uh, has a has a tendency to go roaming right. and ends up fathering, right. un, uh, not to your knowledge, obviously because he's roaming, um, ends up fathering other litters, numerous Correct. litters of animals. Mm -hmm. So especially if you have an unaltered male, um, yes. it does not make the dog docile. Right. Uh, like that's sort of a, a misnomer that's out there right. in the community that oh, well it might make my dog less, you know, uh, manly or whatever you mm -hmm. want to term it, less uh, prone to being uh, barking or being a warning system. And that's not true at all. No, it's not. It doesn't stunt their growth. It doesn't uh, change their behavior dramatically, only in good ways in that, uh, you know, reduced aggression, reduced mm -hmm. roaming. Uh, cats, they're not, not as likely to spray and mark territories, things oh, like that. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know do animals could get breast cancer. Is that, is that mm -hmm. true for dogs and cats? It is. It's but mostly for dogs. It's uh, seen dogs. very commonly. Okay, mm -hmm. only in female dogs. More Usually. so in females than in males. Yes. Oh, just like the human population. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, I appreciate you letting us in on your background a little bit, and um, we have so many issues that come through the shelter, uh, and so many animals every day that it's always good to remind the people who are responsible pet owners of the little things that they can do to help reduce Absolutely. the unwanted population in the community. And one of those things is we do have a grant for a free spay neuter program for the public. If they qualify with income of $55,000 or less, uh, they can call and make an appointment. It may be a month in the future, but they can make an appointment to have to bring their animal to us and you will perform the spay neuter right. on uh, the animals from private citizens. Correct. So mm -hmm. that's a great thing too. Um, so I'd encourage people who might be watching that that meet that income requirement that there's what's holding you back now. Um, please help you know control the population and do that. Um, we'll come back in a moment. I'll like to take a little break and we'll come back in a moment and talk to Dr. Birch some more about the common. Uh, problems and illnesses she sees in the shelter population and how she deals with that and then we'll talk about some of the upcoming events in the next month or two. Page at six. That's a touchdown. Momentum going here early, and there's the inaugural kickoff, and there's going to be a break right there. Bill Jerry, if he can find the speed, he's going to take it to the house and walk up the football. Summit High School touchdown. There's more, oh. and he has got. First down and, and more. He's gone. He's gone. Get it. That's it. Over. Touchdown. That man is sick. We are the Lady Rebel State Soccer Champions. And you're watching WCTV. Hello and welcome back to Pet Watch. We're talking with Dr. Deborah Birch, who is the chief veterinarian. She works full time on the staff at our shelter uh, next to Franklin High School. And Dr. Birch is very busy. We talked in the earlier segment about all the spay and neuter surgeries that she does. Um, our goal is that every animal be spay or, spayed or neutered before it goes into adoption, right? And that's sometimes a little catch up process because the influx varies. Yes. Um, but she spends a lot of her most of every day in surgery. In fact, I tried to take a picture of her for the newspaper and all I could get was her with a mask on. And everybody called me and said, uh, 
we can't see her face. So I said, well, she's always in surgery, so we'll have to catch her. So now they can finally see who you are. Right. <laughs> and no, we're awfully glad to have you at the shelter. Um, we talked earlier about a, a different surgery that you had done on a cat, and you recently had a dog that came in with, and some of our volunteers noticed uh, he had a limp. Right. And since it is an exceptional surgery case, I'd like you to mention how that, how that went. Okay. Well, it was a small breed dog that had gone into adoption, very sweet, uh, and when the volunteers would walk her, they kept putting notes that she was favoring a, a rear leg, and so I evaluated her and realized that she had some hip pain. Uh, we ended up sending her for an x-ray as well, and she had a very dysplastic hip mm -hmm. on the right side and uh, needed surgery to correct it. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it was going to be a constant source of pain, and as time went on, it would actually become more painful and arthritic. So uh, yesterday, we actually did hip surgery to correct that problem, and uh, she has since been adopted and is going to go home shortly uh, after wow. she's recovered. So, so that's hip dysplasia, which is a yes. common a common ailment in, in dogs, but normally in the past we would have had to find a specialty surgeon outside of our building, so we're awfully glad that you're able to do those kinds of surgeries when they do come up. Uh, it saves the county money and it makes the animal obviously more comfortable, mm -hmm. which is our goal. We don't want an animal in pain, right. um, and if we can fix it, that's great. Right. Um, it's so wonderful to hear that those kinds of things are going on and, and it points out the importance not only of your uh, vet tech staff and the daily uh, staff members who are in contact, but also our volunteers. Yes. Um, they're in there loyally every day, walking the dogs, getting to know their personalities, leash training them, and they, they can come up with some interesting observations yes. that, that you or I might not see on a quick visit. Right. Um, so uh, it's wonderful to have them and to have a staff like we do that can write a note and say, I think this dog is limping and, and you take it from there. So that's, that's a great case of, um, of a specialty surgery that we're, we're now able to do. And um, uh, it's probably something the public doesn't even know we would perform on an animal to right. get them adopted. So right. that's great to know. Um, as a shelter vet, what common illnesses are you always on the lookout for? Because whenever you get a group of cats together or a group of dogs together in a captive environment, you have a, a kind of uh, apparent breed, breeding ground for anything contagious. But what are you always looking for? So let's start with cats. What's the most common shelter issue that you're always on the lookout for with, with our cats? Well, definitely upper respiratory tract infection. So sneezing, uh, runny noses, runny eyes, uh, those are very contagious. They spread very easily and particularly right now when we have a high density of cats and their stress levels go up and that makes them break with these upper respiratory infections and uh, so that's what I watch for mostly there. Mm -hmm. So even the adult cats that are separated in in different kennels that the sneezing is airborne and it could go transmitted Correct. from a someone who's caring for them going to the next one. Right. So our staff is always aware of hand washing and glove changing and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, upper respiratory infection in, in, in the cat population is something you don't want to run rampant. So whenever a cat has an upper respiratory, they get isolated in a different Correct. area of the building. Correct. And then they get treated. Right. Okay. And then they're returned to adoption when yes. they're well. Yes. Okay. And I can see the obvious problem with the kittens mm -hmm. because sometimes they're three and four together yes. when they're small. Yes. So, and I think they're probably more vulnerable. Right. When they're ill. Immature immune systems. Right. And, right. Yeah. How early can you uh, spay or neuter a cat? We like to wait till they're three months or at least three pounds. It's just. Okay easier on them and they're um, it's just a safer procedure if they're mm -hmm. a little bit bigger. Uh -huh. So even though we we try to spay or neuter all the cats before they're adopted, there is occasion where someone might adopt a kitten, Correct. make a deposit and bring that kitten back Correct. for their surgery. Yes. All right, what about dogs? What is, are the most common um, illnesses in animal in mm -hmm. dog populations in animal shelters? Well, we see a lot of diarrhea in dogs, and that can be stress-induced or it can mm -hmm. be parasites. Uh, the other big thing that we tend to have outbreaks from time to time is kennel cough, or it's a bronchitis, mm -hmm. 
and again that's spread airborne so it's hard to uh, control and when you have so many dogs in a, mm -hmm. in a small space. Mm -hmm. I, I saw a, a dog recently that at the shelter that there was a suspicion of kennel cough and I was amazed that the, the veterinarian who was there that day made a very quick, there's a very quick way that a veterinarian can tell if a cough is just stress induced or right or if it's really kennel cough mm -hmm. but but it's important and people at home should know um, the signs of those kinds of things in their pets as well right. um, I know we had a rare case of distemper before you came on board and we uh, basically quarantined all the animals in the building mm -hmm. and were able to prevent the spread from that one uh, stray so it is a risk yes. when when animals come through the door mm -hmm. that they could be they could have something so the the shelter environment is like every dog that goes to your veterinarian all got together at one time and shared yeah. their germs. Yeah. So it's a different world. It is. Um, but we have a great uh, track record in, um, in the years I've worked there, I don't know of a sick dog that's ever gone out the door with an adopted family. So mm -hmm. that's a great thing. Yes. And um, that's why having an on staff veterinarian is so important to mm -hmm keep the population well in the shelter and, and to provide a healthy dog. Right. Um, and the pedigree food is part of that program. Uh, mm -hmm. Since we got on board with that, we're providing the nu nutritional balance that all the animals mm -hmm. need. And it, it actually improves not only their internal health, but sometimes I've seen it improve their, their coat and oh, yes. their appearance. Mm -hmm. it, does food, the, the food that you choose to your pet have that much of a... Absolutely. Okay. And Feeding a consistent diet is very important as well, just for their, you know, upset stomachs and mm -hmm. changing foods very frequently. But uh, the the food definitely contributes to overall coat health and just with the, you know, if it's got nutritious ingredients and fatty acids, it can mm -hmm. definitely give our pets nice fur coats. Well, it's important for people to know um, that we take good care of of the animals that they're coming in to adopt. Um, let's talk about adoption and when a person comes in, they will be adopting an animal that's been fully vetted by you, Correct. evaluated. It's probably been there more than two weeks. Yes. Um, it's received all vaccinations that it could possibly need. Um, what other advice do you give a family that's adopting a shelter animal? Mm -hmm. Well, I still think that they need to take that pet to their regular veterinarian to have an examination done mm -hmm. and just to establish that relationship and that uh, their um, vet gets to know their new pet. Um, but also introducing their pet slowly to any other pets that they may have in the house to make sure everybody's getting along and that there isn't any friction with the new pet in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, but. And that can take a couple of weeks. Absolutely, and especially in cats, it can take up to a month or so mm -hmm. for them to acclimate to a new member in the family. Yeah, yeah. my friend just took in a, a, a stray a dog and had an established dog in the home, and it's taken three months for those two, and now they lay down together and take naps. Yeah. But it, it took a long time. They got closer and closer, and there was less snarling and territorial behavior, but, but they had to ride it out. Yes. Um, and often people ask us, well, is this dog good with cats, the dog I'm adopting? We don't know. This, you know, shelter animals have been under a high stress situation. Mm -hmm. They've been lost, they've been found, they've been living in a shelter with strangers, yeah. and they've been walked by strangers every day, and now they're getting a permanent home. Right. So it's like kind of like bringing a new baby home. Right. They're, they're going to cry a little bit yeah. <laughs> and uh, they're going to get have to get used to you and you're going to have to get used to them. Right. So I, I'm with you. I would encourage people to not expect the first hour to be um, easy from, you know, the minute they get home. It's going to take a while right. for, for pets and children mm -hmm. who've never had animals before to learn how to interact with a cat is different than interacting with a dog. Right. Um, and I think what you said about taking it to your, your own veterinarian is important. We do give everyone a complete medical record of their pet. And uh, I would take, if I adopted a shelter pet, mm -hmm. even knowing it had been under your care, I would take those papers and go to right. establish a veterinary relationship if I didn't already have one. 
uh, within the first couple of weeks I was home. That way that record is started, mm -hmm. you know the next time you need to go, um, and what do our, our pet owners at home need to do? It is, an annual visit is always in order for, yes. for a domestic animal that we right. have, it, right? Right. And vaccines are boosted usually once a year, depending on the pet's lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, but also the you know heartworm testing for dogs, making sure they're on prevention to prevent heartworms, right. making sure our pets are protected from fleas and ticks. Mm -hmm. All those things, you know, your veterinarian can make sure you're on a regular schedule and with the right product for your new pet. Those other than being annoying, fleas and ticks do carry diseases Absolutely. that can harm your animals. Yes. So I appreciate all your advice. Um, yes. We appreciate all the great care that you give the animals at the shelter. And we hope our viewing audience has learned a little bit today about uh, how to care for their own pets. And uh, if they come to adopt, they'll know that they've been a veterinarian in charge, right. of their, <laughs> in charge of that animal before they've taken it home. And I think that gives people great comfort to know um, that, that we're providing the same kind of care they would uh, right. for their own pet. I'd like to talk about a few things that are happening with Williamson County Animal Control and Adoption during November and December. Our, our theme for those two months is a home for the holidays and that's to encourage you to give a shelter pet a home for the holidays. It speaks for itself. Uh, animals are a great addition to any family and any kind of adoption should be taken seriously. We don't encourage getting a puppy on <laughs> Christmas Eve but um, we do have a number of great animals. Uh, most of our shelter pets are older animals that need, are in such need of a home and love and we appreciate you uh, coming by and looking at them and thinking about giving them a home. On Saturday, November 16th, we'll be at PetSmart in Brentwood with adoptions from 11 to 3. And then on Sunday, we're having our November 17th, our first Sunday event will be in downtown Franklin on the front lawn of the Frothy Monkey Restaurant. That's right there at Five Points. We'll be there from 11 to 2. So if you're downtown on Sunday morning, come by and see us. We'll have animals for adoption and information for you as well. We will be closed on Thanksgiving Day, Thursday, November 28th. However, the next day on what's known as Black Friday in the retail market, we're having our own form of Black Friday sale. Uh, unfortunately, in the shelter world, sometimes the black animals are the last ones adopted. Uh, we have a number of animals, dogs and cats, that are beautiful, they're ready to be adopted, and they just happen to be black, beautifully black color, uh, cats and dogs. And any black animal on Black Friday will just be a $20 adoption fee that day. So we'll be there at the shelter for our regular hours on Friday, November 29th for that special event from 10 to 6. And if you'd like to shop online during the holidays, I encourage you to go through a website called adoptashelter.com. It's a portal to uh, no, uh, several hundred to a thousand retailers. So if you're planning to do some holiday shopping online, use adoptashelter.com, choose us as the beneficiary, and then do your shopping. And we get a percentage back of all the sales that are made if you go through that portal, adoptashelter.com. It's also on the county website. You can click on it there at adoptwcac.org or the Williamson County Government website. Uh, so if you're doing any online shopping, we'd appreciate it if you'd make us the beneficiary of that and we'd receive a donation. If you'd like to become a volunteer, you can also go on our website, adoptwcac.org, and at the top you'll see uh, Volunteer Online where you can click and sign up for the next training class. If you're thinking of adopting, please come to one of these events or come by the shelter at 106 Claude Yates Drive. That's just north of Franklin High School. We're open for adoptions Monday through Friday from 10 to 6 and Saturday from 11 to 3. Now you can call us at 790-5590. Dr. Birch, thank you again for being thank with you. us. I encourage all you listeners to go on Facebook and friend us at Williamson County Animal Shelter. It keeps you up to date on great stories about adoptions, events, and all kinds of things you can help us with. We appreciate you watching Pet Watch. We hope to see you again next month. I could talk to the animals Just imagine it Chatting with a chimp and chimpanzee Imagine talking to a tiger Chatting with a cheetah What a neat achievement it would be If we could talk to the animals Learn all their languages Maybe take an animal degree 
I'd study elephant and eagle, buffalo and beagle, alligator, guinea pig and flea. 